This is not an ordinary 3D printer. Deep within its base lies one of the most sophisticated devices humanity has ever invented. Its oddly shiny surface hides more than just transistors. This is digital light processing, a matrix made of millions of miniature mirrors and motors that measure mere micrometers. Today we learn how it works, what it enables, and why DLP is the future of 3D printing. Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, today we go very small. This is a small episode about small things made by a small man. This episode is sponsored by Anycubic to celebrate the launch of their brand new printer, the Photon D2, one of the very few maker-friendly resin printers to use DLP technology. My channel is usually about building projects, but this is one of those times where the parts are cooler than the whole. I gotta give Anycubic credit for not just letting me rip apart their latest and greatest to show off the guts, they actually encouraged it. I originally proposed a third Gridfinity video tentatively titled Gridfina 3, Tokyo grid, but Anycubic's team was so proud of their work, they insisted I do a deep dive into the actually ridiculously advanced technology that it's literally built on. And I guess we're going to use that technology to build stuff on. This sentence kind of got away from me. I want to be absolutely clear, uh, my intention here is not to make an infomercial for the Photon D2. Our focus today is on the technology, the digital light processing. There are a whole bunch of DLP printers out there made by a whole bunch of companies, but Anycubic happens to be the only one who charges less than a thousand bucks for it, while simultaneously being the only one that paid me. But let's not get ahead of ourselves because we are DIY people. We don't just use things. We rip them apart and sloppily put them back together and then use them as long as we don't get distracted by another project partway through. When I say DLP, I am actually talking about digital micro mirror devices. Digital light processing is Texas Instruments brand name for their system. I am going to trample on their trademark and use DLP and DMD interchangeably. You know, we're talking about the technology here not a specific brand, and if you're DLP'd, you can DM deal with it. Let's start by learning how it's made. The digital micro mirror device is a micro optoelectromechanical system, a goofy but accurate name for baking optical elements and moving mechanisms right into an integrated circuit. On a very high level, I'm aware you know everything, be gentle commenters, integrated circuits begin as a thin wafer of silicon. The fabricator lays down a film of a metal, mineral, or polymer mere atom thick, then precisely engraves details using light, chemicals, and light-activated chemicals. They repeat this over and over again, stacking up, building up, and carving out millions, maybe even billions of tiny components. Usually this means logic gates, capacitors, and effigies of SCP-4885, but there's no reason you're limited to electronics. The same process that makes high-density semiconductors possible can also construct springs, heaters, motors, tubes, pumps, tuning forks, even interlocking cogs and sprockets that actually move, all at micrometer scale. Micro... Oh, Jesus, this is hard. Microelectromechanical chips are everywhere. This iPhone alone contains a MEMS accelerometer, compass, gyroscope, barometer, depth camera, multiple microphones, timing chips, and more, each one of them ticking with microscopic silicon clockwork. In other words, the steampunk future is here, you just need a scanning electron microscope to see it. Taking tiny transistors and tiny motors and adding in tiny mirrors is just a half step forward. Unfortunately, I'm about 7,000 patrons short of a scanning electron microscope, but I do have a 3D printer and everything looks like a nail. I've taken the liberty of making a delightfully half-assed science fair model to show how this works. Behold, a single DLP micro mirror, 20 million times actual size. It's a mirror, in this case ripped off one of my wife's makeup thingies, mounted to a stick called a yoke, which itself is mounted to a flexible crossbar called a torsion spring that lets it tilt in two directions. I say mounted, but in the real deal, the mirror, the yoke, and the spring are all made of a single solid piece of aluminum. The fact that it's a metal has very important properties for the drive system. After all, there's no point having tiny mechanisms unless you power them with tiny motors. To move the mirror, I've glued magnets to the underside and put an electromagnet under each corner. I'm aware my electromagnets are just spools of wire, I'm very lazy. When I run voltage through one of them, hey hey hey, the coil attracts the magnet and pulls the mirror in its direction. Power one or the other and you can now aim the mirror and thus any light hitting the mirror left or right. A real DLP pixel is so small, it doesn't need magnets. We can move it using electrostatic attraction. 
A circuit beneath the corners gathers and concentrates electrons, and the difference in charge between the electrode and the mirror pulls them closer together, tilting light in that direction. Dump the charge and the yoke boings back into the neutral position. The DLP driver can do this on every pixel simultaneously, causing the whole display to instantly snap from frame to frame. This means A. Digital micromirror devices don't have artifacts you'll see on other kinds of screens like tearing, smearing, etc. And B. That makes this chip literally 3.7 megabits of buffered static RAM that you can read the data off by shining a flashlight off of it. Yeah. If you don't think that's cool, uh, I don't think you should subscribe to my channel. It only gets worse from here. Add in 3,686,399 more identical micro mirror assemblies, and you have yourself a very, very large version of the very DLP chip in this very printer. I will leave that as an exercise to the viewer. A micro mirror array acts a lot like a display, except instead of blocking light like an LCD or emitting light like an LED, it redirects light like a mirror. One position sends the light down into lenses and out into the world, and the other direction sends it straight into a heat sink painted black, where it's converted to heat and blown away by a fan. The black coating on the heat sink absorbs it, because light not bouncing off a surface is what makes something black. With the right light source and optics, you can use this to project a crisp image with smooth animation as bright as you can make it with blacks that are absolutely pitch black because the light never leaves the projector. Let's compare this with an LCD display, short for Liquid Crystal Display Display. Every single LCD, yep, including that one, is actually transparent. It's a delicate sandwich of two polarizing filters at a 90 degree angle between glass plates and clear electrodes with a juicy liquid crystal center. LCDs don't light up, they can only get darker. So usually they have a backlight behind them, but back in my day we didn't have white LEDs for backlights, so we painted the back with reflective paint and we liked it. To make color, you just paint colored squares on one of the filters. LCDs have big problems. For one, a black pixel is not really black. It, it can never block all the light it's supposed to because quantum shenanigans means some amount always makes it through. But a clear pixel isn't much better. It only allows through about 5% of the light. Uh, the filters, electrodes, and the liquid crystal eat up the rest. Also, when you block light, it doesn't disappear. It's absorbed as heat, which you now have to remove from the LCD before that sensitive panel goes this is fine for most electronics, and sure enough, LCDs are the most popular kinds of displays, you know, we make. The uh, worst case scenario is you get some drab colors and grayish blacks, and those aren't deal breakers. The only thing they break is your immersion, forcing you to confront the reality that you will never be a real robot ninja treasure hunting hacker fairy who gets to choose between poaching endangered species from a hoverboard and using endangered species as a hoverboard. I don't even know what I'm promoting anymore. But suppose instead of a piddly little LED panel, your light source is a 5 kilowatt xenon arc lamp designed to fill a 15 meter screen with lazy superhero tropes from across a theater. That's enough power to make celluloid film literally explode if the film reel jams for half a second, and it is certainly enough to incinerate any LCD you put in front of it. But suppose you had a display that instead of absorbing unwanted light, merely reflected it then the display wouldn't heat up as much. Hmm. That's why more than 80% of movie theaters are built around DLP projectors. And it's also partially why movie theater movies look different than watching the same thing in your miserable, lonely studio. Daylight scenes can pummel your retinas, nighttime scenes are so inky black you can't tell where the screen ends, and because every pixel shifts at the same time, action shots have this snappy frame-to-frame -frame clarity that evokes a physical film cinematic crispness. If you want to be persnickety about it, projectors actually have three DLP chips, one each for red, green, and blue. Back before this was, you know, affordable, projectors spun a color wheel in front of a lamp and just displayed each frame one color at a time. For most people, persistence of vision would sort it out, unless you're someone like yours truly who could see the individual flickering colors, and it was highly irritating. Leave a comment if you too remember the obnoxious rainbow projector effect, so A, engagement, and B, I know I'm not 
not the only old person on YouTube. Many pocket-sized Pico projectors like this one also use DLP, but for a different reason. These things are so small because they use lasers instead of conventional lights, which lets them get away with smaller optics and throw the image on a shorter distance. For safety reasons, the lasers in consumer products have to be very low-powered, and the picture would just be invisible if 95% of the light was gobbled up by LCDs. There's another application that calls for powerful lights, crisp details, and perfect blackness. Resin printing. We got there. Resin printers create very small models with incredible detail by shining a powerful ultraviolet light into a clear bottom vat of liquid resin. The photons energize catalysts in the resin called photoinitiators, causing them to link up nearby molecules and form a rock-hard polymer sometimes form a rock out of polymer. For those listening instead of watching, this is Dwayne the Rock Johnson, it's a pun. The trick is in shielding the areas that you don't want to print, which keeps them liquid. Most hobbyist models use a technique called masked stereolithography. This is a very hard episode to pronounce. An MSLA printer literally displays a cross section of the model on a clear LCD panel. You shine a floodlight through it, raise the plate, display the neck slice, so on and so forth, fabricating a highly detailed print one layer at a time. Here's the catch. Because the photo initiator works by absorbing light, photons can't penetrate very far into the resin. The layers have to be extremely thin. 50 microns is the standard, and if it took more than a few seconds to expose each one, a Space Ninja bobblehead would take weeks. You need one heck of a powerful light even before an LCD eats 95% of it. This brings us back to today's sponsor, Anycubic, and their brand new Photon D2, one of- You can't see that printer in the- well, I'm gonna stop gesturing at it then. Photon D2, one of the very few hobbyist resin printers to pack authentic DLP optics. Nearly all home gamer resin machines use LCDs, but micro mirror based projector printers like the D2 thrash them so comprehensively across so many criteria, it is genuinely hard to explain the differences without coming across like a paid shill. I mean, I am, but I don't wanna sound like one. As you'll see, the Photon D2 makes sharper, faster prints with less power and less noise, and it just slaps. This is the cutting edge of Maker Resin printing, and you can learn more and get your own from the link in the description. In fact, this edge is so cutting that at least as I wrote this video, the link in the description is the only place to learn more and get one. Let's check out the incumbent. In this corner of the ring is an Anycubic Photon Mono X6K state-of-the-art MSLA printer. Its UV floodlight emits about 28 watts of light, which doesn't sound like a lot, but my entire filament closet is lit by a 30-watt light, and the light weighs half of it. This thing has a high-quality LCD with an entire 6% transmittance, meaning the LCD eats up 26 watts of heat, one and a half times more than this soldering iron. A high-quality printer's LCD, the most critical component burns out after maybe a thousand hours of exposure. Considering this snake took seven and a half hours, that's not a very long life expectancy. To add insult to injury, even this purpose-built monochrome screen has a 350 to 1 contrast ratio, which means a third of a percent of the light still makes it into areas you don't want to expose. Again, doesn't sound like a lot, but that's like a flashlight across the room. And by the time you blasted in enough photons to solidify it, light leakage has cured and blurred a lot of the surrounding details. Let's compare this with a Photon D2's DLP system. This here is the ultraviolet lamp, the DLP chip is right here, and this is the heat sink, more accurately a light sink that absorbs all the black pixels. Because the optical path is nothing but lenses and mirrors, there's no LCD in the way, remember, the D2's lamp can cure layers just as fast with one quarter the power, which lets it use a quieter fan. A DLP chip lasts somewhere around 20,000 hours, which I guarantee is longer than your interest in resin printing. Because there's no light leakage or scattering, this thing can make crisper, more precise models. In fact, they're actually too crisp. Uh, this thing resolves every single voxel in its full jagged glory. The extreme precision is what makes DLP printers really common in dentistry and research labs, but we are not quantum dentists. We're nerdy amateurs. Anycubic sent over a special resin for DLP that solves this problem by adding a pinch of ceramic powder to diffuse the light a little bit. We can get a similar effect in software by using anti-aliasing. This is 
literally the same technology you'd see in a video game that smooths out rough edges by kind of averaging between pixels. For all intensive purposes, DLP completely ranches LCDs when it comes to resin. They both expose resin with a UV lamp, but DLP does it better, cleaner, and more efficiently. As it stands, resin printers like the D2 are the minority, but I truly believe that MSLE printers that pack LCDs are going to become obsolete. Thank you so much for indulging my exploration of the baffling sophistication that is modern consumer electronics. I don't really do a lot of videos about technology itself or other people's products, but I could be persuaded in the comments. I hereby extend my most nanoscopically precise thanks to Voidstar Labs patrons. Folks like tongue tingling lab scientists Trag. Gisberg, Svetoslav Velikov, and Cooper Digital free me from algorithmic pressure so instead of having to beat the same dead horses, I can experiment with funky video idea tangents like this one. Our most radical collaborators are Brian D. Swollen Nut, Jeremy Arnold, Shweddy Vag, Creality Online Store, Caster the Catboy, Karen Hausman, Command, and Chuck Faduk Smaldong. I've been told the Creality Online Store is an independent retailer that merely carries Creality products, but I bet they are not pleased to support this particular episode. I hid all of their names somewhere in this episode like a Floridian attorney shredding classified documents. Can you post them on Twitter? But the fellas who really make me worried about getting demonetized are our lab assistants. These exemplars of class and taste include Katz, Michael Roche, SXP, Protagonist, Nani? Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, Lord Anorak, the Letter Z, Azundo, Wielder of Iron and Heater of Shrink, Scroto Sagan, Storm Bee Design, Varka, Brad Cox, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater, The Benevolent Misanthrope, Thomas B. Myers, Eddie, Isekai Elf, Mahiro Chan, Des, you know, Boulder Creek Yard, James, One Handful of Beans, Steven Six Foot Six Figure Six Pack Schulte, Ergobled Vajazzle, The Antifa, Good Suck, Sir Derpington of Derptopia, Bob Dobbington, Acorn, Granville Schmidt, Bum Tickly 69, Booba Kiss, Sanforian, Onyx Plague, Iron Rain, Ethan Gomes, Trucku, Lydia K, Kevin DeGraff, My Dog is a Bear, Talon, Democratic Socialist, and a Pretty Righteous Dude, Rusty Flute, Danny Devoid of Life, Max Luck says if you can't fix it, you don't own it, Verviser did nothing wrong yet, Ryan Guler, The Cuttlefish, Powerful CCH, Ashley Coleman, Bad at Karate, Trump did nothing wrong, I'm guessing they don't work for the FBI. Burn it! Gary Duvall, Period Clots, Burn Duck 3, Brad Stormer, Sunburn Cat, Nathan Johnson, Hank Scorpio, Little Bobby Tables, oh god damn it. Kyle Fisher, Bill Schooler, Cameron Swords, you better marry Brooke Shields. Zach, Trans Rights, DSA, and the patron whose name I have refused to pronounce in full until today. Queen Zoestra, Chairman of the People's Republic of the Abyssal Plain of Infernal Delight, Slayer of the Mad King, Challenger to the Citrus Throne, Mistress of the Gulag, Keeper of the Pit, the Great Automator, the Demon Sister, and all-around incorrigible troll. I do not know how you become a mistress and a chairman simultaneously, and I have no intention of finding out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on 4 million tiny mirrors in the future.